This is Edward Siegel. Welcome to the Crisis Ahead podcast. Each week, we look at how companies, organizations, and individuals in the news are responding to, managing, or recovering from a crisis, and what you can learn from their successes or failures. My observations and recommendations are based on my experience managing crisis situations and advising others on how to respond to and bounce back from disasters, scandals, and other emergencies. I'm glad to welcome you to the expanded edition of my weekly Crisis Ahead podcast. I'm honored to have as my guest today, Richard Levick, who is the chairman and CEO of Levick, a public relations firm in Washington, D.C. Richard is a seasoned crisis management expert who has had a role in numerous headline-making international crisis situations. But before Richard joins us, I want to share with you some of my thoughts and observations about an important crisis management lesson that COVID-19 is providing for companies and organizations. The lesson is this. Before you can recover from a crisis, you have to be sure the crisis is over. Unless and until a disaster, scandal, or other emergency is really over, everything you do about it could be a waste of time, money, and effort or could make matters worse. Not only is the coronavirus crisis not over, some people and companies are helping to make things worse. How? By ignoring proven and effective ways to avoid being infected by the disease. In New York, so many people have been violating the state's guidelines for social distancing that Governor Andrew Cuomo threatened to shut down Manhattan, as well as the Hamptons seaside communities on Long Island. The governor is not alone in his concerns. Health experts say that the premature reopening of restaurants, stores, beaches, and other public areas could prolong the coronavirus crisis. Indeed, more than a dozen states have already seen an alarming increase in reported infections and hospitalizations. Some organizations are more cautious and prudent than others about reopening for business. For example, Sports teams are not rushing to put players back in front of thousands of cheering fans at arenas and stadiums. In the meantime, sports leagues are taking steps to protect players from getting infected. Major League Baseball prepared a 67-page draft health and safety operations manual that was distributed to all players. National Football League Commissioner Roger Goodell sent a memo to all teams that outlined the steps they must take even before players can return to their team's facilities. The National Basketball Association said it would launch an abbreviated season on July 30th at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Those games will certainly be much quieter than usual. No fans will be allowed to attend. And although the PGA has let golfers back onto the fairways, The only way spectators can see their favorite players will be to watch them on television. The entertainment industry is in no hurry to hold large gatherings either. Last week, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences postponed next year's Oscar ceremonies from February until April. So, given what others are doing to protect their people, what are you doing to protect your employees, your customers, and the public? How are you doing it? Are you doing it the right way? Whose advice are you following? And how current is that advice? The reality is that there is still much that we do not know about COVID-19. Even some of the early assumptions about the disease were shown to be wrong. Another reality is that as of today, there are no safe and effective treatments or vaccines for the pandemic. And those who act as if the pandemic is over could be in for a very nasty surprise especially if there is a resurgence or re-spreading of the disease. How will we know when this crisis is really over? When the data, facts, and scientists say it is. Until then, any company, organization, or politician who behaves as if the coronavirus is a thing of the past is just rolling the dice and gambling with the health of others. As a crisis management expert and consultant, I would never advise a client to gamble that their crisis was over. I'd want proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that the light at the end of the tunnel was not another oncoming train. I've written a new book that provides additional advice on how you can prevent, manage, and recover from a crisis.
crisis ahead. 101 ways to prepare for and bounce back from disasters, scandals, and other emergencies. Crisis Ahead is now available as a paperback book wherever books are sold and as an ebook from Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Crisis Ahead is filled with case studies of how companies and public figures have prepared for and handled crisis situations. The book also includes checklists and exercises to help you get ready for and react to a crisis. You can learn more about the book at publicrelations.com. It's not too early to start preparing for the next crisis. That's because history shows there is always a next crisis, and the sooner you are ready for it, the better. I wanted to kick off the expanded version of my Crisis Ahead podcast with a top-notch guest who has been in the trenches of crisis management. I wanted someone who would share some of their stories, anecdotes, and the lessons that they've learned along the way. Ideally, I wanted someone with a broad perspective about crisis management and who has a background in communication, law, and the media. Well, my guest today is Richard Levick, and he certainly checks off all of those boxes and many more. Richard is the chairman and CEO of Levick, a public relations firm in Washington, D.C. He has had a role in numerous headline-making international crisis situations. Richard is a TV news contributor on crisis and public affairs communications, columnist for multiple publications, co-author of books, a pioneer of litigation communications, a globally recognized crisis communications keynote speaker, and on top of it all, he's a professor at the Fordham and Wake Forest Schools of Law. Welcome to the Crisis Ahead podcast, Richard. Well, you certainly have had quite a distinguished career in crisis management. Tell us about some of the situations you've been involved in. Well, Ed, first of all, thank you so much. It's great to be on your show. And uh, that was very kind of you uh, with your introduction. It was so such a mellifluous introduction that I, don't, I think we're out of time, right? So we uh, uh, thank you. Um, in, conclu- in conclusion. In conclusion, no. right. <laughs> So, you know, over the years, we've represented over 30 countries. We handled many of the highest profile matters in the world, the Gulf oil spill, Catholic Church, Guantanamo Bay, the Boko Haram kidnappings for then President Goodluck Jonathan of Nigeria, many uh, matters out of the Middle East, uh, China. Uh, you know, and I think, it, and, and Ed, you know, you and I struck up a friendship in part because we started talking about the human element, that what you do next really matters, and that being a leader in an ascending market when everything is going up, uh, it seems challenging at the time, but it's pretty easy in comparison when everything is going down, when suddenly you're the villain in the tragedy as opposed to the hero. And that, I think, is when when leadership is tested. Before that, it's just profit-taking. Mm-hmm. And uh, of everything you've been involved in over the years, um, what's the most challenging crisis you've been involved in, and why was it so challenging? Well, certainly there are any number of them, and I think that let's start with the president and then go back uh, a little further. Representing Chinese companies right now is tremendously challenging. We're moving increasingly to a new Cold War, if you will, with China. Certainly we have a trade war already in place. Uh, and as a result, regulators from the Justice Department and the SEC uh, and others, uh, the FCC, have become very aggressive. You know, I've read some press releases recently that, quite frankly, you know, I've been at the, in Washington for over half a century. And I just, it's, it's really hard to imagine having read any press releases as vitriolic as some that I've read from uh, U.S. federal regulatory agencies. So I think right now is a really challenging time for, for Chinese companies, particularly Chinese tech. Uh, you know, BP, uh, as we move backwards a little bit, I think uh, challenging, but how different that would be if it occurred today than it did a dozen or so years ago, as it was in the, uh, uh, it was a main story. It was on CNN wall to wall for 108 straight days. Think, try and think of a news story that's cut through the clutter in the past three years uh, for more than a few days. Uh, you know, Boeing, 
uh, comes to mind, but not much else. So I think that for the industry, it's a really challenging time because unless your story is about Donald Trump, COVID, or the new civil rights movement uh, and BLM and, and related issues, it's really hard to get more than back page coverage. So that's, you know, that's another uh, new challenge. And, and we're increasingly moving to an AI world, and we've all represented clients where false information has been put on the internet, but spreads with such speed that it's incredibly challenging to help, help your client uh, at the level you'd prefer without spending an extraordinary budget uh, in order to do that. So those you, are just you a few of the things. Go ahead, Ed. I'm sorry. Sorry. You mentioned uh, Boeing. What's your take on how well or poorly they've, they've managed their crisis situation? Well, I think, you know, you know we're all pretty critical of Boeing because it's not just one crash. It's two. It's Ethiopia. It's Malaysia. Um, it's, uh, there are a number of factors here, I think, that are, are pretty interesting. And part of it, and I think here's a key takeaway for other CEOs, and other board members. Boeing's tragedy and the way that they've had, they've dealt with this uh, slowly is born of the fact that most of the time we're looking in the rear view mirror in terms of how we've handled crisis. So when Boeing in the seventies buys uh, McDonnell Douglas and they had the DC 10 rollout and they have four accidents uh, with it, they knew that the market would permit them the time to get it right. When Boeing spent so much money over the decades, increasingly becoming not just a regulated company, but an influencer with the United, uh, with the U.S.'s um, uh, aviation, uh, uh, the FAA, with our aviation authority, it was a smart strategy up and until these uh, this the second. Uh, uh, Seven, the, the second crash. And the reason is, is that if you'll notice, US FAA historically was not the first to ban the airlines, but in fact, among the last. And so what that meant was Boeing's strategy of being so close and intimate with the FAA, a strategy that has worked successfully for decades, no longer is working as other federal uh, agencies akin to FAAs and other countries are going to have outside influence in terms of regulation going forward. Uh, three, I think we can all look at uh, you know some of the communications while trying to be emotional to the victims came across as too stiff. I don't want to quite go so far as to say tone deaf. But when they finally brought in an outside communications crisis communications firm, you noticed almost overnight that the tweets and the communications became more personal. And I think, again, we get to institutional issues. Boeing looked at it as engineers would. They would look at it as a, a company that's highly dominant in a marketplace. And crisis always is, it turns everything upside down. And when that happens, the past is no longer prologue. You have to look at things differently. And that was a huge challenge for Boeing. So what's the lessons from Boeing? Don't do it yourself and hire an outside firm? Well, I think that's certainly part of it. But I also think you need to notice that First of all, when the first crisis occurs, when the first crash occurs, they need to be much more thoughtful. They need to be doing the chronology. You know, this is a really simple thing. It sounds tactical. But how many companies uh, on the verge of or in the beginning of a significant crisis actually does on the board or on, you know, a PowerPoint or, or whiteboard, but in some visual way does a chronology? EpiPen didn't do it in their crisis. Clearly, Boeing didn't do it. Martha Stewart didn't do it. And the reason you can tell that they don't do it is because if you start to put these visual cues out there of things that have happened in the marketplace, and in Boeing's case, you could go back 50 years, as I mentioned, the DC-10s, you can go back to the acquisitions uh, and the mergers, you can, you can see things that are influencing them. If uh, you're tracking social media, you can see patterns. If you're looking at that globally, you can see patterns. So a key one, number one is you, you do a chronology, you know, Gulf oil spill, 
And uh, our client there wasn't BP, but one of the Japanese conglomerate holding companies, an enormous uh, company. And those first 72 hours, as they so often are in a crisis, uh, are dispositive. And by 48 hours, the lead counsel on that, Tom Campbell, a partner with Pillsbury, said to the client, and the client, again, Japanese, so you're in a shame culture, uh, which means you have to be very, very sensitive about working bad news up through the organization, had identified all of the risks. You know, we had the war room going, and you have Tokyo, you have Australia, Sydney, you have, uh, you have the Gulf, the U.S. Gulf, et cetera, et cetera. And he identifies all of the risks. And then he says, and my favorite five words uh, ever in a crisis, he says, look, I'm identifying $2 billion of U.S. regulatory uh, potential liability. And then he says the five words, tell me why I'm stupid. Tell me why I'm stupid, which is what he was saying was, if anyone here sees any other greater liability, then that will rule. If it's IR, if it's brand, uh, if it's recall, whatever it is, what's the highest risk? And that's what dictates. And you know, sitting across from Tom in that room and thinking, we, we don't have more than $2 billion in brand equity risk here. So legal is going to lead. That decides. If you do that early on, you do the chronology, you do the exposure, you know, when you're in a crisis, you're drinking from a fire hose and you're sitting there trying to think, well, legal says this and IR says this and HR says this and brand and social and crisis. And they're all saying different things. We saw that at AIG tragically. Um, and what happens is paralysis by analysis. You have too much information too quickly. People don't make decisions at the speed of crisis. When you know your chronology, when you can start figuring out what your future gating events are, what are things that are going to happen next, when you, when you have a pretty good sense of potential liability, it helps you decide the path you're going to take, the sacrifices you're going to make. And tell us a little bit about AIG. What was that situation and how did you handle that one for them? Well, you know, AIG is on that list of very, very challenging matters because they didn't have to be the tallest guy in the room. And, you know, a few moments ago, I talked about things being upside down in crisis. If you go in the way back machine and you go to the beginning of, you know, 2008, 2009, the financial collapse, Lehman Brothers is the bad guy. They're the ones who are being painted as uh, not being responsible with people's money and, and treating it as if it's monopoly money. And at that time, in fact, it was either the same day or the day thereafter, right after Lehman Brothers has been excoriated on Capitol Hill. And remember that Washington, you know, never kick a man while he's up. It's too much work. Wait till he's down. So Lehman Brothers now is, is the poster child for what's wrong on Wall Street. And I would say this also. Remember, in up markets, you know, we're all capitalists. We're all capitalists on the way up, but we're all socialists on the way down. Right? <laughs> so it's, okay, everyone can have theirs because I know there's plenty for me. Currently, right now in this country, we're in a scarcity mentality environment. And that's why people think the pie is really limited. And it's one of the reasons why there's so much anger. But here you have Lehman Brothers testifying before Congress, being excoriated. And within 24 hours, AIG decides to pay a series of multi-million dollar bonuses to a group of about 30, 32 executives in Connecticut. And the public goes apoplectic. You've just taken TARP money. Now you're paying these multi-million dollar bonuses. And that instantly made AIG the poster child. We forget Lehman Brothers. And it took AIG 10 years to recover their brand status. And I think the lesson for everyone else is just because you're contractually obligated pre-crisis to do something, it may be that the liability incurred by breaking that contract is less than the pain that will be incurred by becoming the ogre, the, the devil in uh, the crisis. And I think AIG, and I articulated it at this time, I said, you know, you've got, you've got three options here. Ed Liddy had just be, uh, joined the firm coming out of retirement from Allstate. He's working for a dollar a year. He, within 24 hours of joining AIG, he's on an analyst call. I'm listening and he's brilliant. 
how he had so much knowledge and understanding of AIG spoke so calmly. He was really terrific. And we immediately realized, boy, AIG not only has the right person at the helm, but we have a terrific communications asset. So shortly thereafter, senior executives are talking about these bonuses. And I said, look, you've got three choices here. One, you can um, pay the bonuses, but make sure you run to the light and you admit, and you've got Ed Liddy as his asset, and you can say we're contractually obligated to pay these. We're going to pay them because if we don't, then our shareholders and investors are subject to treble damages. And now being 80% owned, 79.9% owned by the federal government, we don't want to incur that. Or you could say, we are not going to pay those bonuses. We are contractually obligated to do it, but we don't believe it's the right thing to do. Let them sue us. There are treble damages, but that will take years. And the most important thing now is to be a good steward of your money. Or three, you can pay the bonuses and hope nobody notices. And I said, two of those three options are good. You can pay them and admit, or you cannot pay them and admit. Either way, you do it in daylight, but you run to the light. But trying to hide it by paying them and hope nobody notices because you think business as usual is a disaster. And we saw the same thing around the same time when two of the three big three auto execs out of Detroit flew to Washington on their private jets, uh, GM and Chrysler. I think that uh, Ford did not, as I recall. Normally, you want your CEO taking the private jet. Their time is too valuable to be sitting at TSA for two hours before getting on a plane for an hour flight. You don't want them wasting their time. But here they are at a moment going to Washington to, with their handout to collect TARP money, the Toxic Asset Recovery uh, Plan Funds. And so it looked tone deaf. They're flying in their uh, own private planes. And people are thinking, well, if you've got a private plane, you don't need my hard-earned tax uh, dollars. Fascinatingly, or interestingly, a couple of years later, John Strumpf of Wells Fargo is going to testify before Congress because Wells, one of the few banks that stayed out of the 2008-2009 debacle, you know, they've been known for 100 years as the People's Bank, John Strumpf takes the Excella to Washington which he proudly shares with members of Congress, thinking that this is the question that sunk the car execs. It's not going to happen to me, right? I'm not going to get sunk by that. What he didn't realize was looking back is not the best way to prepare. There, that just happened to be the low-hanging fruit for the auto execs. You know, the problem Wells Fargo has is much Bigger. And John Strom tragically was not prepared to, to deal with that environment. And that gets to one last thing, and then I'll turn it back to you, Ed, which is if you're testifying before Congress, and an error that too many executives make is that they're only trained by lawyers for the legal answers. And that's essential and critically important. But Washington is theater. When, you know, when Congress is open, we call it theater season. And you also have to be trained by your communications professionals. It's not just what you say, it's the entire show. Well, those are certainly great examples of what not to do or how to create your own crisis. Do you have any examples of people who, people and organizations that have done it the right way to prevent, manage, or recover from a crisis? Any good role models that uh, companies and individuals should follow? Well, you know, I think, there's, I think there are lots, uh, and we'll get into them. And, and one of them, ironically, is Wells uh, up until uh, the false account controversy. But, you know, they had handled the financial crisis very well. Another example of a company handling it very well or an executive handling it very well, brilliantly well, until he didn't, ironically, is United and Oscar Munoz. We remember the Dr. Dow incident three years ago when Dr. Dow, Vietnamese doctor, is defenestrated, if you will, by the Chicago Transit Authority, violently removed from the plane. It's caught on two videos. It takes place on a Sunday night, and by Monday morning, it's viral. And here's the critical thing, is that Oscar Munoz formerly had been the CEO of CSX, a client at the time. They had had toxic spills. He had handled them brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly, empathetic, running to the light, 
um, admitting to the issues, working with local officials have been absolutely terrific. In the Dr. Dow incident, he and his team so mishandled it for the first three days. Now, by Wednesday, it happens on a Sunday night, by Wednesday, after there's so much damage, he finally watches the video, and then from that point forward, does everything right in terms of apologies. But what he did wrong in those 72 hours is emblematic. He hadn't seen the video, had only read about it um, in uh, the Chicago Tribune. His first inclination was to look backwards before he had joined United as the CEO. They had had labor problems five years previously. He saw it as an opportunity to support labor, so he leaned into them. On Tuesday, he sends an email, an internal email to all 88,000 United employees. Uh, here's a news flash for your listeners. If you send an email to 88,000 people, it will leak. And of course it did within minutes and it becomes known as the second non-apology apology. And critically, by Wednesday, uh, and I mentioned that Dr. Dow is Vietnamese, 20 million Chinese per hour were downloading the video and viewing it and saying this is anti-Asian bias. And they viewed it that way. And why that's so critical is because United had been spending the previous three years trying to expand in China as their most important expansion market. So within 72 hours, you've, you, you've significantly harmed 30 years worth of work. And I think the takeaway lesson, Ed, is that even when you have such great and thoughtful leaders who have lots of experience in crisis, you're only as good as your next crisis. Another example, I think that Marriott uh, with the pandemic has been uh, initially very, very good. AT&T, the beginning of the Black Lives Matter uh, protest, very, very good. One of the first corporations to show leadership. Now that raises another question, though, Ed, which is I think that we are at, it's, there's no question, everyone knows, we're at a historic moment. This is as if 1918, 1929, and 1968 had all occurred, not only in one year, but in one quarter. We are dealing with these incredible moments, uh, destabilizing, historic, and, and uh, in the case of, of BLM, opportunistic for us to try and get right uh, the tragedy of, of the original sin of slavery. But what it also means for companies, what it means for crisis counselors is that talking about it uh, is not enough. Doing just a single diverse, uh, high profile diversity hire or a few being better than your competition but not good enough, ads with diversity, uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility, ESG, you know, in, environmental and community, it's not enough. You're going to have to do a full audit and look at your company and say, how are we not just talking the talk, but walking the walk? And you saw criticism of some of those companies I just mentioned who were initially lauded for their leadership. But then, you know, you look at AT&T and they're the fifth largest funder of Tom Cotton. Uh, author of the, you know, the famous op-ed in uh, the New York Times two weeks ago, encouraging uh, more use of military force against protesters. Hmm. Well, for those companies and individuals who are running companies, or top managers who have not had to deal with a crisis yet, um, what advice do you give them? Uh, what skills do you think they need to prepare for themselves for when, not if, they have to deal with a crisis for their own organization? Well, you know, a few things here, and thank you for the great question. One is tracking. How are you tracking information? And I don't think that most companies do that very well. We haven't radically changed enterprise management in the last decade. We're still looking too much in the rearview mirror. And I think that we hire enterprise uh, risk management to be weather men and women, but instead they're really historians. They're looking backwards to see if these patterns will repeat themselves. And yet, if we study the internet closely, if we study social media closely, we're going to see patterns. Fracking, Keystone, Offshore, Sugar, GMOs, Me Too, the list goes on, EpiPen, the list goes on and on. There were always canaries in the coal mine. 
So if you're a company, you know, how EpiPen missed the rising criticism on social media that took place two months before Congress got involved is remarkable. How people missed the growing Me Too movement. It took the industry, uh, Monsanto and Syngenta, 13 years to respond online to the first anti-GMO website uh, in 1999. So one, are we tracking uh, just Google search to see what comes up when our company name or the issues we work on or our products are used? Two, what are we seeing in terms of search engine marketing? Three, what are we seeing in terms of hashtags? Four, in geotargeting, what are we seeing? You know, the plaintiff's lawyers have to go online in order to find classes, in order to sue in class action matters. So, if you are looking at keywords and well, we'll just take the word sugar or obesity and you don't see a lot on it on Tuesday, but by next Tuesday, you see two plaintiff's firms with search engine marketing campaigns. That tells you something. And if a few days later you see a third, that tells you something. If you see an NGO being involved, it tells you. And I have to tell you, we, it doesn't take a genius on fracking on, uh, on uh, the Trans-Canada Pipeline, on GMOs. Uh, so many times we have pointed out to the industry and said, see this? When this HBO documentary, Gasland, goes from television to being the number one site when you look up the word fracking, it tells you on the, on the internet, a movie has now gone, has morphed to the internet and it's controlling search. And if you're not controlling search, you're not controlling what happens next. So it's only a matter of time. So one is to be looking at forensics, either yourself or hiring a firm to do it. Two is the silos that have worked so well for 70 years don't work very well anymore. You need the multi-talented team so that IR, GR, PR, HR, brand, all of them are working together. And, you know, at AIG, everything was deliberately separated. And so many large companies, it's separated by floors or buildings or cities or countries. We have to have a multidisciplinary team approach because people are going to see the problems differently. Probably the time when uh, BP was criticized the most uh, in testifying before Congress was that they were well prepared by lawyers, but not well prepared communications. And so they, they took on one challenge well, but not others. You need multidisciplinary teams. Three, practice ahead of time, not just tabletops, work with your multidisciplinary teams ahead of time, get to know each other. The hardest thing to do is tell truth to power. People are afraid and fear for their job or for their contract and telling truth to power. And if you build those relationships ahead of time, you will be able to tell the, uh, the share the hard truths with the key decision makers. Well, that's great advice, certainly. My last question for you, Richard, is for those companies and organizations who have a crisis and they figure uh, quickly, we're not going to go it alone, we need help. Tell us about the services and expertise that uh, Levick, your company, uh, provides for companies well, that are in trouble. Th thank you, Ed. And, and we, you know, we tr uh, have been handling high-profile, major you know, global crises for well over two decades and it's very different out in the marketplace now. And Ed, you, you and I have talked about this offline. Everyone says, who's ever handled a slip and fall, oh, we do crisis. You even see you know, advertising firms and brand firms with uh, crisis practices. And I, and I think that there's a real difference in terms of you, you need to understand the legal or potential legal issues. You know, uh, I'm a lawyer, as you mentioned. There are other lawyers in the firm, but we're not a law firm. But we can understand and appreciate when we're dealing with questions about where's the sacrifice going to be. We, we can understand with nuance where the lawyers are going. To have people who understand Wall Street, if you're publicly traded, and what the sacrifice is going to be. To understand uh, social media and intelligence. We like to say that intelligence informs strategy. If you do not know where the problem is emanating from or why, then you're just guessing. And while there are many other things that I could add, and Ed, thank you so much for this opportunity for this commercial, 
I would say that one of the things that we do is try and provide our clients with a conduit to some of the potential adversaries. So, you know, we've worked with over 300 of the world's largest law firms. We've gotten to know an awful lot of the plaintiffs' law firms around the world, particularly, obviously, in the United States, and we know how they think and how they use media. With the NGOs, I, I, I come from that, uh, you know, my original career was working for Nader-based organizations, Ralph Nader-based organizations for many years, maintaining a lot of relationships in the NGO community, and sometimes you need to negotiate them uh, with them quietly. We can provide the black, back channel. We did, uh, it's with some of the Arab countries that we've represented, providing back channel to Israel on certain sensitive matters. And you know, the, the ability to do that and look at crisis, not as lipstick on a pig, not as spin, but is how do we solve the problem? And that's what we like to bring to the table. Well, that's great. I wish we had more time, but uh, hope there's an opportunity for you to come back on my show later and continue our conversation. Our guest today has been Richard Levick, Chairman and CEO of Levick, which is a public relations agency in Washington, D.C. Uh, Richard, thanks again for being my first guest, and I hope it's not the, uh, I know it's the first, but I hope it won't be the last time you join us. Ed, thank you so much. As always, terrific to see you. Good luck with your show and with your new book. Great. Thank you. appreciate it. My thanks again to Richard Levick, Chairman and CEO of Levick, a public relations firm in Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Crisis Ahead podcast. Remember, it's not a matter of if companies and organizations will have a crisis, but when. When. 